I clicked record and it says. Ah, perfect. It, Thank you. It works. Oh, it's also transcribing, so I have to switch that off. I think. Thanks. So, how do Thank I do you. it? Um, no, we don't see it, Renee, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, all set. <laughs> Thank okay, you. good to go. Thanks. Yeah. Um, right, so my name is Stefan Fenninger. I'm an associate professor of energy system modeling at TU Delft, and so I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes or so telling you about some of our work on, well, what it says here on the title, understanding the option space for the sustainable energy transition, and then we're going to consider and add consideration of material needs and circularity into that. So here's the problem that we're dealing with globally. We are emitting a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, and the vast majority of those emissions are from the energy sector, basically from burning fossil fuels. So if we could eliminate those emissions, we would have most of the climate problems solved. And my job is basically to turn what looks like mission impossible into something that might actually be possible and doable. So one of the things we do together with my team is to figure out how is it possible to build an energy supply system that relies as much as possible, ideally close to 100%, on clean and renewable sources of energy, like the examples here, solar, wind, hydropower, or bioenergy. Now, how do we do that? Well, we use energy system models, and this is, I'm going to run you through our European model. This was built primarily by Bryn Pickering, a former postdoc in the group, and this model represents all of Europe's energy demand. So from industries, um, uh, including the, the demand for fuels, in the future it's going to be synthetic fuels, no longer fossil fuels, uh, transport demand, heating demand, electricity demand. And the model includes the spatial distribution of these demands. So here, um, the example of um, heating demand across space. The model includes all of the relevant technologies for energy supply, for conversion, for transport, for example, the power grid, um, and the possible locations in Europe where these technologies could be built. And finally, it also includes uh, both the supply, for example, of renewable electricity um, and the demand, for example, of heat throughout the year on an hour by hour basis. And given all of these ingredients together, the, this model, this energy system model, runs a massive mathematical optimization problem, which designs a cost optimal energy system for the entire European continent to supply all of these different energy demands. Now we can include various constraints in here. We can say, for example, that these demands must be met fully by renewables um, without any imports whatsoever of any fuels, fossil fuels or otherwise. Now, the second thing that we put on top of this model is what we call spores. That's an algorithm uh, designed by Francesco Lombardi. Um, He's also a postdoc in my group and just recently became assistant professor. And he designed um, this algorithm to generate near optimal system designs. So I can start with the cost minimal solution uh, coming out of this European model, which has a certain configuration of technologies. And then I can say, OK, I'm actually happy to accept solutions that cost up to, say, 10% more than this cost minimal solution. And it's pretty reasonable to say that economically these solutions are equally feasible for, for many reasons, including the fact that the future cost of technology is highly uncertain anyway. But by doing this, by allowing the costs to go above the minimum cost, I'm opening up a really wide decision space around this optimal solution in terms of what technologies I use, where I build these technologies, how I operate these technologies, and so on. So I can find system designs for climate neutral European energy system that looks substantially different from the cost minimal one, the cost optimal one. And we did just that for the European model I just showed, and we generated 440 different near optimal solutions. Uh, it's in this uh, publication, uh, sorry, this publication here, Pickering 2022. So using these two ingredients, we can show that it's possible to replace the situation from today, represented here by the statistics from 2018, 
where almost all energy in Europe comes from fossil fuels. That's the gray bar here. With a future where almost all energy comes from renewables. And we have a range of solutions here indicated by the two bars with the minimum and the maximum future energy need. Again, those are the 440, the range spanned up by the 440 different solutions that we generated. And this is driven by the fact that some of them rely more or less on electrification. Electrification is generally very efficient. Um, so the more you electrify, uh, the more energy use overall goes down. And this is just an example result from the study to give you an idea of the spatial and technical detail in the model. On the left hand side here, we see the, the overall uh, electricity generation mix that the model um, puts into place and where in Europe uh, the majority of these uh, generation technologies are deployed in. In the middle, we see which parts of Europe are on average importing electricity um, in red or exporting electricity in blue. And we also see the yellow dots here. That's where the model places the uh, hydrogen production hub. So where most of the hydrogen needed in this clean energy future are uh, is, is made in Europe. And finally, on the right, we see where the model wants to expand the existing um, electricity transmission system. So the thicker the blue lines, the more uh, the electricity uh, grid um, between these two locations is expanded. And what you don't see here is that we have this hour by hour estimate of service and demands for energy services and the hour by hour generation potential from renewables also built into this model. Um, so our model also ensures that every hour of the year, all energy demand is met. And to do that, it can, for example, build storage systems like batteries um, or rely on, on pumped hydropower storage and so on, the whole range of technology. So how do we actually make sense of these very different solutions? Like I said, our model can generate very different configurations that I can just cycle through some of the examples here of, of different possible future energy systems that um, this model spits out. So rather than looking at maps, one way to understand this is to summarize the whole complexity of the system into just a few aggregate metrics so that we can represent each of these solutions by just a single point. Here's one such metric, the amount of electricity storage capacity needed. We can score each solution for our metric, zero being the solution with the least amount of storage needed and one being the one with the most storage needed. And we can look at where the other 440 solutions fall. That's what we see here on this plot. And we can do that for a whole range of metrics that you see here. This allows us to look at trade-offs between choices. So here we're looking at the storage capacity, then the curtailment, the amount of renewable electricity that's wasted, the amount of biofuel uh, utilization, so whether or not the model decides to actually use the biofuel potential in Europe. On average, how much electricity uh, needs to be imported into European countries from their neighbors, so how, how independent European countries are in terms of their electricity needs, then how equally electricity and fuel production are spread across the continent. Those are the electricity and fuel Gini coefficients. The extent to which the model uh, uses electric vehicles as a source of storage and flexibility for the electricity system. And finally, the extent to which heat and transport are electrified or remain powered by uh, fuels, um, clean fuels in this, in this case. So I might want to now start looking at this decision space and say home in on this amount of uh, storage capacity needed. I might be worried, for example, about uh, the use of materials for, for batteries. Um, so I could say, well, let's look at solutions that require as little electricity storage as needed. And we can pick one solution here, and I'll just mark that with an orange cross here, and we'll call that the the low use of storage solution. Now I can look at how well this solution performs on all of the other metrics that I have here. And this low use of storage solution actually uses 100% of the available European bioenergy potential. Now I might be concerned about that as well. I might be, I might say, okay, I, I would actually like to use this land um, that's used here for biofuel uh, production. I might want to use that land for something else like 
for example, conservation, reforestation, or other agricultural purposes, you name it. So I might say, okay, well, is there a solution that requires very little biofuels? And of course there is. We can look at a solution um, that I called here the low use of biofuel solution, and it actually turns out that this particular solution requires even less storage than the one I looked at earlier. So I have little electricity storage, low use of biofuels, but there are other trade-offs then. This particular solution, for example, requires nearly 100% electrification of heat demand. That also makes sense because uh, if we remove biofuels from the system, there's very little left that we can still use uh, to make heat uh, besides electricity. So we have to supply most of the heat demand through electricity. So we can look at these options um, and all of these options are considered equally feasible technically and economically by our model. And we can use factors that a model like ours cannot easily handle, like whether or not you have a preference for or against bioenergy. We can use these kind of factors to home in on solutions that are desirable for real world decision makers. So I, um, yeah, I looked at these two solutions now, and but we, we call them the low biofuels uh, solution and the low storage solution. Um, but of course we have other things. We have, for example, the transmission grid. So the transmission grid expansion between these two solutions looks somewhat similar. It looks, it's, it looks somewhat different in, in where in space the transmission grid is expanded. But the, the, the total magnitude of work required, the total magnitude of expansion required is similar. So I can also search through my solutions and look for another one that requires much less grid expansion. So comparing here the total numbers 1.5, 1.3 terawatts to just 1.7 total uh, terawatt total grid expansion in this low grid expansion solution. So we thought it also makes sense to make it easier to allow ourselves as well as um, others to explore all of these different options using the metrics I just showed here. And for that, we then built an interactive web application where you can actually um, restrict the, the space for um, uh, or restrict the range for some of these metrics and then um, zoom in and, and actually click on individual solutions on the bottom left here and then see how these solutions um, look in space. Uh, in their spatial distribution of technologies and use this to kind of explore this decision space. Okay, so this summarizes what we found so far. Um, and I'll just give you a second to read through this so that I can catch my breath before we move on to the next part. <clears throat> so, so far we've been looking at different energy system configurations that we can make or, or explore with our modeling tools. Now let's um, expand uh, consideration to other aspects or factors that might make or break the possibility of this transition. So we, we said, okay, really broad variety of technically feasible and completely climate neutral European energy systems exist. That's great. But clearly the, the story is more complicated than that. So this is where uh, material use come in, comes in, critical raw materials in particular. Now there's a lot of debate about these and I don't want to go too much into, into all these debates right now. It seems that for some or maybe most of these materials, um, there does not seem to be a physical limit or, or shortage, but we probably still want to consider the resource requirements as an additional possible trade-off in planning. For example, it could be really hard to ramp up production fast enough on the time scale needed, or as we also see here, the production of certain materials might have very severe local impacts. And so what we're doing right now uh, for a wide range of materials um, using uh, life cycle inventory data, and, and this is uh, work led by Fei Wu, a PhD student in my group. And, and what we're doing is we're looking at the same European energy system configurations that we looked at before. So I, I'm plotting the same examples here, low biofuels, low storage, low grid expansion. 
but we're now assessing them in terms of their material requirements. So we're taking the results from our energy system model, the capacities for different technologies that would need to be built in Europe, and we're coupling that with an analysis of the materials that you would need to actually build those technologies. Now, because the absolute numbers uh, for all these different materials are actually very different, um, we normalize everything to a baseline so that we can compare it in one plot. And that baseline here is the cost optimal system configuration, so the least cost solution. And we compare all the other uh, possible solutions to that. I want to focus in a little bit on a couple of materials uh, so that we can um, see a bit more clearly. And you can see that there are very substantial differences here. For example, looking at chromium all the way on the left here, we see that two of our example solutions use more than 50% more than baseline. With iron, on the other hand, we have a solution that's the low storage solution here that uses considerably less. So even without going further into the specifics of this, it's very clear that the material needs for these different possible systems are quite markedly different. Now, one thing that we see here and in this selection here um, is lithium in the center. Lithium needs are pretty much the same across all three of these example solutions. Now, what if I'm worried about, I don't know, for example, the speed at which lithium mining can be ramped up or the local impacts of lithium mining? We'd like to see if I can find possible European energy systems that require a little bit less lithium. So I can go back to my overview chart and look at the degree to which different solutions electrify transport. Basically, that's how many electric vehicles are out there on the roads. And there's a solution here, which this, this particular solution has the lowest transport electrification across this sample of solutions. Uh, only around 53% of transport is electric here. So we can include this solution in our analysis and look at um, how well this does on material needs. And in fact, this particular solution seems to be doing much better than all of the other solutions for at least this selection of materials right here. Um, particular in terms of lithium requirements, simply because dramatically fewer electrical vehicles with uh, lithium ion batteries are on the road. But of course, this solution comes with other issues. For example, it requires a lot more renewable electricity generation capacity to make hydrogen and synthetic fuels, which are then used in the transport system. So we can say that there are trade offs um, between different options for the transition, and these trade offs mean that. Ultimately, difficult decisions have to be made about which drawbacks are acceptable. If I really don't want to expand the transmission grid, I might be locking myself into a small subset of possible solutions that force me to use certain materials or certain minerals that I'd rather avoid. Or if I want to avoid using certain materials like lithium, there's considerably less maneuvering space for the remaining technology choices. So we can add another point um, to the earlier uh, summary items. Considering material requirements opens up additional criteria for decision making, complicating the search for acceptable trade offs between solutions. Basically, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And well, that doesn't sound like a very positive conclusion, but I think it's important uh, to do this work. Uh, we can't just sit here rosy eyed and hope that this um, energy transition will magically happen. These trade offs are real, um, while at the same time, the decisions to actually go in a specific direction in planning and implementing this transition are really urgent and have to be made. Still, I also want to end on a slightly more positive note. Um, and to do that, I'm going to zoom out of Europe and take a quick look at Brazil. So here, um, in collaboration with several Brazilian universities, we're doing very similar work as what I just showed for Europe, but for the Brazilian energy transition. Now, this particular study is led by Paula Borba, a postdoc at the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research. And here, one of the key focus areas is on land use and biodiversity protection. Without going into the details, uh, when we run an energy system model for Brazil in much way, uh, in much the same way as, as I just showed you for Europe, we found that in fact, in some cases, you can have your cake and eat it too. What we did here is we put a lot of attention on land use, and we looked at scenarios where we classify 
priority lands for conservation. Those are highlighted in dark green here on this map. So there are areas that are not currently protected, but have a high value for biodiversity or conservation reasons. That's about 25% of Brazil's land surface. And we find that when we run a high resolution energy system model that covers all of Brazilian energy demand, similar, similar to what I just showed you for Europe, then even when we remove this 25% of land completely, so no energy use allowed, no wind turbines, no solar farms, uh, no agriculture for biofuels, nothing, we still find solutions for a climate neutral Brazilian energy system with very little or no cost increase. So this tension on the right hand side here that popped up a little bit too early, um, this tension between energy use, biofuels in this case, and, and conservation, this tension exists, but in the case of Brazil, there are pathways that combine a broad expansion of conservation with fully clean and renewable energy. Now, what this study, um, which isn't out yet, but uh, hopefully will be soon, what this study doesn't consider is actually international trade um, in energy, international trade in fuels, for example, biofuels, or maybe synthetic fuels derived from renewables. When we add that into the mix, uh, the question is once again open whether Brazil would be able to export large amounts of, of hydrogen, for example, without compromising um, uh, conservation or an expansion of, of conservation. So it's important to also consider this final summary point, the, this option space and the trade-offs are very different elsewhere in the world when we look beyond Europe. And this might matter a lot when we start considering trade, trade in synthetic fuels, trade in hydrogen, trade in biofuels. Um, and if we still want to ensure that the European transition um, is really sustainable and that we don't just externalize um, negative environmental effects elsewhere. OK, so I, I really have to apologize because you might be here for answers, but basically all I've shown is that there is a really broad range of possible futures, um, and there are many, many open questions uh, about uh, which future we might actually prefer and, and want to end up in. But the idea in this kind of research is really um, to build normative scenarios, to build what-if stories using computer models, and to then run experiments with these computer models to help us better understand decisions in the real world, like this trade-off between material needs and different possible strategies to build a clean energy system. And as I've shown, we have some answers. For example, a 100% renewable energy system is possible, but there are many open questions, especially how to get there and what exact system to actually build. So these are some of the tools we develop and use for this. Um, and I just want to highlight that actually resolving a lot of these problems are really interdisciplinary in nature. So collaboration across disciplines, uh, like between my own and industrial ecology, is really important. So I'm always interested in having a chat about any of this um, and uh, talking to you and working with you. So for now, that's it. Thanks a lot for your attention and uh, looking forward to any questions uh, or discussion.